Hello, my name is Dr. Tamás Fézer. I'm an assistant professor at the University of Debrecen in Hungary. I'm teaching civil and commercial law, both in a European and a Hungarian perspective, mainly torts, contracts, competition law, and corporate law. I spent five months as a Fulbright Scholar here at Indiana University, and IU Cary School of Business asked me to give some lectures on various European law topics, private law topics. This lecture is about product liability in the European Union. First, we will examine the circumstances and political reasons behind the EC Directive on product liability. Then we will check all the definitions and basic provisions of this EC Directive with using the interpretation of the European Court of Justice. And finally, we will focus on some economic effect, reforms, and criticisms of the Directive. In Europe, a common standard of strict liability in product liability cases has been introduced with the EU Directive 85 per 374. Before the EU adopted the Directive, most of the 10 member states had no special law for product liability problems. In general, member states applied the basic fault-based liability rules for product liability cases. Fault-based liability enabled the producer to excuse himself with proving a reasonable conduct under the given circumstances. But we could find a few exceptions before 1985. For example, in Germany, statutory law introduced strict liability in drugs injury law. This was not a general rule for all product liability cases, just a special legislation for drugs injuries. Another notable exception was France, where despite of the fact that legislation did not adopt special rules on product liability, courts found solutions, both in contract and in tort law, to impose strict liability in many cases of product liability. These initiatives were partial and only true for a few member states. By the middle of the 80s in the USA, product liability became a well-developed area of tort law. Although the European Union made every effort to build up the common market, product liability was one of the neglected areas of EU legislation. But it was still obvious that a common market needs rules to protect consumers. The basis of the European product liability conception was the US model. In the USA, the attention for the victims of product accidents had led to the introduction of a strict liability system in the 60s, and later a continuous extension of product safety regulations. In the USA, a crisis arose in the product liability system in the 80s. It seemed that product liability rules were in conflict with market efficiency, sudden increase of insurance fees, and, and the fear of a slower development in technology in the USA had made the EU cautious when created a strict liability regime for Europe. The EU didn't want to put high liability burden to the firms as it could easily lead to a stop short in the market. On the other hand, firms and companies were also interested in creating uniform rules of product liability in Europe as they felt the potential risk of nat national legislations and judicature to start following the strict US court decisions. And to tell you the truth, this was a real threat for companies. Many of the member states started to deal with the problem, and in some member states, special committees started to create national rules for product liability. Companies and firms were interested in adopting a European directive on product liability rules, and probably this was one of the reasons why the EU directive followed the maximal harmonization method. Maximal harmonization not only introduced strict liability in cases of product liability, but stated a rule that a single member state could not overcome by implementing more favorable legislation for injured victims. On one hand, the directive established a strict liability regime, and on the other hand, the maximal harmonization rule gave a protection to companies and manufacturers.
As far as the majority of the member states were and, and still are following the civil law legal traditions, judicial decisions cannot override statutory law. Having a national law on product liability generated by an EU directive meant a certain protection for companies against individual court interpretations. Beside the fact that the EU directive established a strict liability regime of product liability in Europe, the most substantial innovation was the inversion of the burden of proof. In a fault-based system, the injured person had to prove not only the general circumstances of damages, but the manufacturer's negligence. The EU directive gave a certain consumer protection perspective to the lawsuits and stated that the injured person has to prove only the harm, the defect of the product, and the causal link between the injury and the defect. Manufacturer can no longer excuse himself with the original defense of reasonable conduct under the given circumstances. While fault-based liability focused on the conduct of the producer, the new strict liability model focuses on product characteristic. Proving a causal link between the injury and the defect can easily be burdensome for the injured person. Generally, asymmetric information between the consumer and producer does not let the consumer to have enough information on proving that the injury is actually due to the product. That is why recent reconsiderations of the directive are thinking about introducing a presumption about the causal link. For example, in Germany, court decisions follow this practice, but on a European level, the European Commission only published a green paper on some future reforms and it's still waiting for approval. The directive introduced the maximal harmonization in Europe. As we talked about it, while establishing strict liability, it also pointed the thresholds of this liability. Only some topics and provisions of the directive are subject to derogation. When the directive entered into force, it originally led the member states to introduce exclusions of agricultural products and games, foods not being processed. This seemed to be an unclear logic. The directive originally had a presumption that consumers are well informed on risks associated with the consumption of conserved or hormone enriched foods. That is why the exclusion was possible. But later, when big food scandals like the Medco disease happened in Europe, the directive was modified in 1999 and the strict liability system of the directive was extended to these products as well. Another possible derogation is the implementation of state-of-the-art defense. Later we will talk about this defense more, but, but here we have to remark that state-of-the-art can be seen as a weakening of the strict liability conception the directive aimed to introduce. But on the other hand, state-of-the-art defense is a natural protective element for the market to prevent the slowdown of technology development just because of the threat of strict liability, but we will talk about it later. Another possible derogation is the development risk extension. Some member states like Finland and Luxembourg hold the producer liable also in cases of development risk, while other countries limited this kind of liability to special product sectors. Usually member states introduced development risk liability for food and or drugs. But the fact is that development risk cases on courts are hardly known. The directive also contains a threshold limit, 500 euros, that excludes from compensation a lot of consumers that suffer minor damages from product defects. This limit could provide incentives to risk sharing between consumers and companies in order to avoid moral hazard problems. As we'll see it later, in case of damages caused in an item of property, but not in human health and life, member states had to introduce this threshold. If the damage in property <coughs> is under 500 euro, <coughs> the strict liability rules cannot be applicable 
and the injured person has to seek for compensation under the general fault-based liability system. But it's difficult to understand what was the original reason behind the provision. The fact is that this threshold resulted serious modification in some newly joined member states of the EU. For example, in Hungary, the original 40 euro threshold increased to 500 euros after the accession. Threshold in the directive also has another negative effect. While some of the member states like Finland and Sweden provide law cost tribunals for dealing with product liability claims, many other member states simply do not deal with the problem just because of the 500 euro threshold limit and leave the claims in the hand of the ordinary courts that have slower and more expensive procedures. And finally, we do not have to forget about the fact that the directive only deals with substantive law and not procedural questions. It introduced the strict liability regime in product liability cases, but did not deal with legal enforcement, cheap and effective procedures to collect damages. The definition of a product in the directive is a broad definition. All movables, even if incorporated into another movable or immovable, are considered to be a product. The directive also extends the definition to electricity. The original exclusion of food products and games no longer exists since the 1999 modification. But the broad definition of product gives a wide protection for consumers as no matter how cheap, small the product is or what nature the product has, strict liability rules are applicable in case of injuries and damages suffered due to its defect. The interpretation of a product was never a problem in Europe and the European Court of Justice never got a preliminary ruling from a national court to interpret the definition of a product. National courts also take this broad definition seriously. The definition of defect is more problematic than the definition of the product. The general rule of the directive states that a product is defective if it does not provide the safety which a person is entitled to expect, taking all considerations into account. The merely subjective definition is completed with some exemplificative aspects. When examining a defect, the courts have to take into consideration the presentation of the product, the use to which it could reasonably be expected that the product would be put, and finally the time when the product was put into circulation. These guidelines make the interpretation certainly easier. Misuse by the consumer and scientific technological knowledge at the time the product was put into circulation do matter. It's important. The sole reason that a better product is put into circulation later doesn't mean that the older product is automatically defective. Harms in the directive are divided into two categories. The distinction is remarkable as in case of property damages a minimum limit exists while personal injuries are compensated even if the injured party suffered only minor damages. The first category is about damage caused by death or by personal injuries. An optional provision in the directive is a limit on total liability for damage resulting from death or personal injury caused by identical items with the same effect and defect. If this option is adopted, the directive establishes a minimum liability limit of 70 million euros. Spain, Portugal, Germany and Greece adopted this total liability limit. The other type of damages is damage to or destruction of any item of property other than the defective product itself with a lower threshold of 500 euro provided that the item of property is a type ordinarily intended for private use or consumption and was used by the injured person mainly for his own private use or consumption. <laughs>
The latter restriction defend companies from paying compensation for damages of special properties, properties do not belong to private use or consumption. This provision strengthens the consumer perspective of the directive, as, for example, if the defective product causes damages in a laboratory or in storage of a business entity, product liability rules are not applicable. The injured person has to be a consumer who bought the product for his private use and consumption and the ordinary environment of the usage is his household. Strict liability doesn't mean that no defense exists. The notable difference between fault-based and strict liability systems is the existence of a general defense. In a fault-based liability regime, a general defense rule can be applied for many conducts and act. In a strict liability system, only certain defenses exist, and these defenses usually do not allow broad interpretation. The EU Directive on Product Liability contains six defenses. The first one, the producer shall not be liable if he proves that he did not put the product into circulation. This is an obvious defense as product liability rules are part of the consumer protection law and aims to protect consumers from damages caused by a defective product they bought and got in a commercial transaction. National courts interpret this defense strict as product samples are considered to be put into circulation even if these samples are free for consumers before the product is available for the public. The second defense is if the producer proves that having regard to the circumstances, it is probable that the defect which caused the damage did not exist at the time when the product was put into circulation by him or that this defect came into being afterwards. The latter defense means that if the consumer's misuse caused the defect and the damage, the producer shall not be liable. The third defense is when the product was neither manufactured by the producer for sale or any form of distribution for economic purpose, nor manufactured or distributed by him in the course of business. This defense clause is about products for internal business use and not for commercial use for the consumers. The fourth defense is that the defect is due to compliance of the product with mandatory regulations issued by public authorities. National and international standards and other mandatory regulations for producing a product have to be kept by the producer. If the standard or regulation was the sole cause of the defect, this is not the producer's liability, but damage is caused by the legislator, the state. The fifth defense is when the state of scientific and technical knowledge, at the time when the producer put the product into circulation, was not such as to enable the existence of the defect to be discovered. The state-of-the-art defense is the only defense that is not mandatory for member states. The directive allows member states to leave this defense from their national statutes and hold the producer liable even if the scientific and technical knowledge was not such to enable the existence of the defect to be discovered. And finally, the producer shall not be liable in the case if the manufacturer of a component that the defect is attributable to the design of the product in which the component has been fitted or to the instructions given by the manufacturer of the product. This defense is about the relationship between the manufacturer of a component and the producer of the final product. From the perspective of the consumer, he can still sue the producer, but the defense exonerates the manufacturer of the component from responsibility. State-of-the-art defense needs further explanation. This is the only defense based on subjective interpretation. All other defenses cover strict areas with no doubt in interpretation. Implementing state-of-the-art in the national legal systems may decrease the effectiveness of strict liability because of the general uncertainty of the definition. But on the other hand, state-of-the-art can be justified 
in order not to weaken the incentive of firms to introduce new products because of the unpredictability liability consequences. There are different interests on both sides. Consumers need clear and unambiguous provisions, while loopholes are welcomed by the firms. The European Court of Justice gave an interpretation to the state-of-the-art doctrine. The European Commission versus United Kingdom case, the ECJ held that in order to be exonerated from liability, the producer must prove that the objective state of scientific and technical knowledge, including the most advanced level of such knowledge, at the time when the product in question was put into circulation, was not such as to enable the existence of the defect to be discovered. Furthermore, that knowledge must have been accessible at the time when the product in question was put into circulation. This means that under the ACG interpretation, the state-of-the-art defense is much narrower than under national laws. The test concerning knowledge is objective, and the only subjective element lies on the issue of accessibility. As we examine the basic definitions of the directive, now we can focus on the product liability claim, the methods of enforcement. The directive burdens the producer with strict liability. The producer is liable for damage caused by a defect in his product. It's vital question for the consumer how to identify the producer. The rules of consumer protection in Europe require a label on every product put into circulation. The producer has to place a label on the product or the packaging with basic information, name of the product, origin of the product, and the name and contact information of the producer or the supplier. If the producer fails to fulfill this obligation, the supplier has to correct this deficiency. The label has to contain the name and contact information on either the producer or the supplier. To help consumers identify the producer, the Directive on Product Liability introduced the presumption. Where the producer of the product cannot be identified, each supplier of the product shall be treated as its producer unless he informs the injured person of the identity of the producer within a reasonable time. This presumption allows consumers to sue the supplier if they find only the supplier's information on the label. If the supplier fails to identify the producer within a reasonable time, the strict liability burdens him. National laws could determine the reasonable time when implemented the directive. Many of the civil law legal system countries introduced an objective time limit, usually 30 days, for the supplier to identify the producer. This is extremely important that this supplementary and special liability of the supplier, not a general rule. If the producer is known, can be identified, the producer shall be liable. There was a misinterpretation in some member states and the ECG held in a preliminary ruling decision that the directive did not establish a joint and several liability of the supplier. The supplier's liability does not exist if the producer can be identified. An obvious question is how to identify the producer? Who is the producer? The directive contains a list. Producer means the manufacturer of a finished product, the producer of any raw material, or the manufacturer of a component part, and any person who, by putting his name, trademark, or other distinguishing feature on the product, presents himself as its producer. Furthermore, any person who imports into the European Union a product for sale, hire, leasing, or any form of distribution in the course of his business, shall be deemed to be a producer within the meaning of the directive and shall be responsible as a producer. As you can see, the directive defines three categories of the producer. Beside the obvious factual situation, the manufacturer, anybody who puts a mark on the product is considered to be a producer.
In the famous Skov versus Bilka case, the European Court of Justice held that the list of producers in the directive is exhaustive. Neither member state legislators nor courts can expand this definition. This is the goal of the maximal harmonization concept. In this case, claimants were contracted salmonella as a result of eating contaminated eggs purchased from the shop Bilka. They commenced proceedings against Bilka under the Danish law implementing the directive and Bilka joined Skov, the producer of the eggs, into the proceedings. Applying Danish law, the Danish court found Bilka liable to the claimant as an intermediary but held that it could in turn seek damages from Skov as the producer of the eggs containing the salmonella virus. Bilka and Skov both appealed the, the decision, maintaining that the Danish law was incompatible with the directive. The ECJ ruled that the directive achieved complete harmonization of the laws, regulations and administrative provisions of member states in relation to the system of product liability regulated by the directive. That is why the list of persons liable under the directive is exhaustive. And the supplier was liable only where he had failed to identify the producer, his supplier. As the Danish law sought to extend liability to suppliers of products in all cases, it was incompatible with the requirements of the directive. The directive established statute of limitations for enforcement. The subjective period is three years. This limitation period shall begin to run from the day on which the plaintiff became aware or should reasonably have become aware of the damage, the defect, and the identity of the producer. As this subjective limitation period begins to run in an undefined time, the directive introduced a long stop period that dismisses all rights to claim damages caused by a defective product. After 10 years from the date on which the producer puts into circulation the actual product which caused the damage, the rights to claim damages are extinguished unless the injured person has in the meantime instituted proceedings against the producer. The term circulation is an important criterion in the directive. To decide whether the product is defective or not, the judge has to take into account the information and knowledge available at the time of circulation. But a far more important application of this term can be found in connection with the 10-year long period for extinguishing rights. Especially in the latter case, the relevance of an objective interpretation of circulation is essential. In general, we can say that circulation means the time when the product becomes available in the market, reaches the consumers. In Auburn v. Aventis Poster case, the European Court of Justice gave an interpretation of circulation. The case concerned the application of the directive to complex manufacturing and distribution agreements within an international group of companies. Mr. O'Byrne claimed that he had sustained serious injuries as a result of receiving a defective batch of vaccine. The vaccine was manufactured in France by Aventis Pasteur, shortly ASPA. The vaccine was purchased in fully finished packaged form by Aventis Pasteur MSD, APMSD, the UK distributor of the product and holder of the marketing authorization. This UK distributor was a wholly owned subsidiary of APSA, the French producer. APMSD supplied the product to the Department of Health, which supplied it to a doctor who gave the vaccine to Mr. O'Byrne. Proceedings were commenced against the UK distributor on November 2, 2000. The claimant was informed by the distributor that APSA, the French company, was the producer of the vaccine and he commenced a separate set of proceedings against it on October 7, 2002, almost two years later. The French producer, ASPA, argued that those proceedings were time-barred 
because the vaccine was put into circulation by its delivery of the vaccine to the UK distributor, APMSD, on September 18, 1992. So we are over the 10-year-long long-stop period. The claimant subsequently applied to substitute APSA for APMSD in the first set of proceedings. The English court made a preliminary reference to the ECG, asking for guidance on when, in these circumstances, a product is put into circulation and in what circumstances the English court was permitted to substitute a defendant. In its decision delivered the ECG ruled that a product is put into circulation when it is taken out of the manufacturing process operated by the producer and enters a marketing process in the form in which it, in which it is offered to the public for sale or consumption. The court declined to follow the Advocate General's opinion, which proposed that in the case of a group of companies, a product was only put into circulation when it left the control of the group. However, the ECG recognized that where ent entities in the chain of distribution are closely connected to the producer, it is for the national courts to examine the factual situation and determine whether, in reality, the related entity is involved in the manufacturing process. This is a question of fact and takes no account of whether the related entity has an independent legal personality or whether the products have been purchased by it and property it in the products has passed. The focus of the assessment should be whether the related entity carries out an activity that is properly to be treated as a production activity or, in contrast, is simply acting as a distributor of a product manufactured by its parent company. The ECG's decision suggests that subsidiary companies which are responsible for packaging or repackaging finished goods are engaged in manufacturing processes and the supply of unfinished products to those companies under intra-group manufacturing agreements would not amount to putting the product into circulation. This means that in every case, courts have to examine whether the intra-group company is just a distributor or a lot more a manufacturer. The last important subject of the directive is the provisions on cumulating claims. Cumulating claims. Claims based on product liability rules can be combined with other protective claims under the national law. Usually other protective claims are warranty rights, claiming damages under the fault-based liability rules, or initiating state authority proceedings. But because of the general conception on prohibition of benefiting from a loss, the maximum amount of damages cannot exceed the actual damages. And now we have to examine the economic effect of the directive on the European market and the operation of the rules in practice. In Europe, the welfare state model on compensation is common. Although non-economic damages are not recognized by the directive, but this doesn't mean that member states cannot maintain or introduce rules in connection with damages for non-pecuniary loss. Physical injuries are compensated through the national health care and social security system. In the US, welfare state provisions are much more restricted than in Europe. In Europe, the social security system is the main mechanism for providing compensation to injured parties. In many countries, compensation by the social security system does not exclude the right to appeal to civil law. Because of this model, the social security authorities, who bear the financial burden of compensation, are entitled to take recourse against the producer of the defective product. A well-known criticism of the welfare state conception is that it has no deterrence function if public institutions do not file claims against the producers. But this form of compensation works better from the distributive point of view. Even if the amount of compensation can vary in the member states, every injured victim automatically receives free health care and public pension. That is why in Europe the amount of damages in product liability cases 
are much lower than in the US. In many cases, the plaintiff is not available and not able to recover non-monetary damages, like damages for pain and suffering, and punitive damages. The dark side of the product liability system in Europe is the costly access to justice. As class action is not common in Europe, the injured person has to sue the producer individually, bearing the cost of starting a legal procedure. The only chance to avoid the high costs of a judicial proceeding is the European version of class action, the so-called popularis actio. Only certain state authorities, consumer protection authorities or prosecutors can initiate a lawsuit against the producer in the name of all injured consumers. The problem with popularis actio is that initiating a lawsuit is a discretionary right of the authorities. If they think that a case is serious enough and have an impact on a large number of consumers, authorities can start the legal procedure but no strict rules exist when a case is serious enough. Another burden for the injured person is that contingent attorney fees are less popular in Europe than in the US. And in some member states, contingent fees are considered to be unethical. Attorneys represent clients for fixed tariffs even if they lose the case. Civil procedures are infamously long in Europe. Because of the lack of depositions outside the courtroom, the trial, a civil procedure can take for one or even five years. And finally, alternative dispute resolutions are not common to solve product liability claims and problems. Low-cost tribunes can be found only in a couple of member states, such as Finland or Sweden. After the implementation period of the product liability directive, the number of product liability claims in Europe did not change. Between 1988 and 1995, only three lawsuits were reported in the member states. Only three. Insurance rates have slightly increased, but a lot lower than expected. Austria can be only the only good example to measure the economic effect of the directive as Austria was the only member state where nearly all cases were solved on the sole basis of the directive. In Austria, insurance policies increased with 100% in four years. One might think that these facts prove the inefficiency of the directive. But before we make a rash verdict, we have to take into consideration some indirect factors of the directive. This slide shows the number of product liability claims in some member states. As you can see, lawsuits are rare. Germany and Austria seem to be the leaders in the number of product liability claims, but 25 or 30 claims in 6 years are almost irrelevant. We cannot say that the small number of claims is because of the inefficiency of the directive. Many studies, articles and statistics show that other factors outside the direct effect of the directive have a remarkable impact on product liability cases. One of the most significant changes since the EU adop adopted the directive is the increased media interest in defective product accidents. As every member state has product liability rules based on the directive by now, Injuries caused by a defective product became the center of the media attention. This new com publicity of the cases results costly loss of reputation of a firm or company. Companies are afraid of being in the crossfire of the media and it results the abiding by the law, the observation of product safety rules and information requirements. Difficult to measure how many out-of-court settlement agreements were established in the last 20 years. Some academics say that companies rather offer a settlement agreement to the injured party than start a legal procedure. And finally, if we take a closer look at the liability insurance of the insurance companies, more and more product liability insurances can be found on the market.
Product liability and product safety rules are in close connection with each other. The EU adopted many product safety regulations that created mandatory quality standard systems. Another successful method of forcing companies to keep safety regulations is the so-called voluntary certifying mechanisms. The International Standardization Institute ISO, introduced international management standards. Being an ISO certified producer means certain advantage in the market. The adoption of a system of quality control can help firms reduce their exposure to product liability to the extent that product safety is increased and any defective product can be easily withdrawn or recalled without any impact on reputation. And finally, product safety regulations result increasing and more powerful law enforcement of the state authorities. The European Union is continuously monitoring the work of state authorities responsible for consumer protection and forces member states to increase the amount of pen penalties and the number of inspections. The directive contains a couple of questions that need further interpretation. The ECG still has not delivered a unified opinion on what information may be taken into account in assessing whether a product is defective. There is a debate whether this definition includes those information and warnings supplied to intermediaries or not. The other question waiting for interpretation is the scope of the development with defense and its application to cases involving manufacturer defects. But again, these questions are more theoretic than practical because of the low number of product liability claims on courts, almost merely academics are interested in these interpretations. Just like the national courts, ECG didn't have many opportunities to interpret the terms and phrases of the directive. Because of the fact that product liability claims are not common on courts, the European Commission is working on future reforms of the directive. A conception for the future is to change the maximal harmonization idea to minimal harmonization. Minimal harmonization could allow member states to adopt more favorable rules for the consumers while keeping the minimum standards in the directive. On the other side, a certain advantage for the firms that the Commission plans to introduce a mandatory maximum threshold of damages, probably 70 million euros. And finally, the European Union is working on a solution to establish alternative dispute resolution panels in the member states or locus tribunals to handle product liability cases more efficient and less expensive as ordinary courts. The EU directive on product liability has not led to an expansion of product liability cases. Neither the product nor the insurance market has been dislocated. But beside the statistics, many out-of-law factors indicate that the introduction of product liability rules and certain minimums in every member state of the European Union was not a useless effort. The next challenge for the EU will be to give up the original maximal harmonization concept of the directive that was originally a protective element for the firms and companies. Thank you very much for your attention.